So when you sent me the email and you said the Jansen brothers, I thought you meant the Hansen brothers. <laughs> I was like, oh, we're gonna do the movie with the um bop guys. That's the sequel. So Ben, Nutcrackers is your first lead role in seven years. What was it like to return to acting and what was it about this project that made you want to do it? Well, it was fun. It's, it, you know, I never really imagined that I would spend that much time not acting. Uh, it wasn't a planned thing, but I was kind of just waiting around for something that I really connected with and been doing work uh, you know, behind the camera a lot. And so when I got this email from David, it was kind of this wonderful gift out of the blue. And we'd been talking over the years about trying to do something together. And he just sent me this, this project. And he had it all thought out in his head in terms of just the idea of what he wanted the movie to be, in terms of working with the kids, shooting on their farm. It sounded like such a unique experience. And it felt so organic to me. It felt like you just really were passionate about this idea. And uh, you know, would have wanted to work with you anyway, but this was a specific thing that you really wanted, it felt like, to get out and to make because there was an urgency about it, I think, that you had because of uh, these kids being kids and they're not going to be kids forever and wanting to capture them. And that, that inspiration for me was so exciting and was really one of the reasons why I wanted to just jump in. And David, this is also, you've been doing a lot of big studio films, horror films. What was it about Nutcrackers that you know, why, why did, was this the kind of project that you wanted to make at this point? For, for so many reasons, you know, most of my career, I, I, I find a comfort zone, then I shatter that and jump into something new. I find a new comfort zone, I shatter that, so that come, and, and always looking for what's new, what's educational, and what's personal. And I try to make everything I do have, check a lot of boxes. Um, as Ben was saying, when I, when I just started brewing the idea, me, meeting the Jansen brothers, these cool kids, and they have this moment in their life that we can either think that should be a movie, or we can think that should be a movie and then go make that movie. Uh, so it, I, I'm pretty impulsive in that way, where I wake up pretty stubborn and determined to get things done. However logical or illogical they are, they always come from some lightning bolt of inspiration. And, and so this was a moment for me, looking at an industry that's, if I look at the, the films playing in the theaters, I think there's, there's a fear of comedy, or there's some sort of disconnect between audiences and, and the material. And, and I look back to my own childhood when I was a movie-obsessed kid growing up in the 80s and thinking, could, could there be the joy and the warmth uh, of those flavors of movies that I enjoyed so much in a movie today, in a very cynical, very different world full of uh, headaches and dark headlines, and, and, and for me, professionally, a lot of dark films. I was just looking for a breath of fresh air and a little palate cleanser and, and, and any excuse to work with my buddy Ben here. And what about the brothers themselves? Who are they? How, how did you find them? So uh, Homer, Ulysses, Arlo, and Atlas are the Jansen brothers. They're the sons of one of my closest friends from college, Carrie. And she actually worked on the first, uh, first few films of mine and then left the movie industry to take over the family farm and raise these four boys. And so um, it's someone that's very connected to me in a creative, cosmic kind of way. And so when I go to the farm and meet them at this age and see their inspiring um, very active life. You know, they're not plugged into video games and iPads like a lot of kids. They're not zoned out on phones and zombies. They're like, they're uh, riding four wheelers and they're running a farm and they're dancing ballet and they're doing such a, a different type of activity than even my own children, certainly at my age. But I think that's, a, that's something for us all to look at and be inspired by is people that, that take a deep breath and love the, the beauty around them and, and find ways to connect to their family and the, and the world. I think also when you sent me the email and you said the Jansen brothers, I thought you meant the Hansen brothers. <laughs> I was like, oh, we're going to do the movie with the um bop guys. That's the sequel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that, then, but, you know, when you go to the house and hang out with them to the farm, there, it is like a wonderland where they're just having so much fun and doing these slightly dangerous things like riding crazy <laughs> dirt bikes and running up on the roof and jumping around but it's their home and they're so comfortable there but there's like an edginess to it because it's kind of like kids you know doing what kids used to do like getting into trouble and you know kind of exploring and 
Um, it just like it was kind of like going back in time or something, or my my imagination of what, what it would have been like. You and, know? and to capture youth in that way, in that spirit, in that way, there's just there's a lot of manicure, there's a lot of polish, there's a lot of, a lot of do's and don'ts of of youthful performances in movies today, and and I just always have gravitated towards the raw and the real. So what is it like to kind of act in that atmosphere, Ben? Like when you come into something like that, how yeah. do you? How does that work? Well, I talked to a, a friend of uh, David's who's, who's acted in a bunch of movies with him, and she gave me some great advice, which was just, she said, just like, you got to give in to David's world and just go with it, because it's unlike anything else. And that was the best, best thing I could hear, because it really is just sort of like letting go of the ideas of what you think uh, filmmaking should be, or the rules. And even like just when, when you said, I'm going to do with these four kids, I, my first thought was, well, like a normal movie, they'd have like auditions and, and chemistry readings for, you know, to see who, which kids work well or whatever. And he's like, no, we got these four kids. And I, and I was like, well, maybe should I meet the kids? He's like, no, you're going to meet them when you come down there, and it's going to be great. Um, but it was very chaotic in the best way, and I think intentionally so, where he just wanted to keep it alive and keep it, um, you know, loose uh, so that. And first of all, I think that, that the boys could just feel comfortable and, and he could you know, get the best out of them and, and who they were. And we're also shooting in their home um, and, and there's animals all around. It wasn't sort of created. I mean, this is the way that they, their, their house is. It's like there's, I don't know, like eight or 10 cats and there's guinea pigs and there's goats and, um, and dogs and hogs. I mean, not all in the house, but sometimes coming in and out of the house. And um, it's... You know, he was trying to capture that, which is hard to do in a movie when all of a sudden you bring, you know, a full film crew into this small space because that affects it, you know, because all of a sudden by having those people there, all of a sudden it's not, you know, the same place because it's, it's filled up with all these people and self-awareness. And he really did everything he could, I think, to get rid of that and to allow uh, this life to happen on screen. And so, you know, it was every, every day was an adventure. What was it like to shoot the scene with the chicken, and has it changed your relationship to rotisserie? Uh, <laughs> unfortunately not, um, and I have an awful double standard when it comes to chickens, because I love chickens, but I also will eat, I, I will eat rotisserie chicken <laughs> and other kinds of chickens, and I, I have to, that's something I struggle with probably uh, since the movie a little bit more, but um, it was more, I think it affected more my hamstrings and my joints, uh, my <laughs> knees, what I thought I could do, what I thought, you know, by the end of a take, it would be like, all right, you know what, let's just, uh, can, I, can I get like a makeup touch up, which was really just so that I could like, you know, breathe. Um, but it, it's, it's like, it's, there's a reason why, you know, Rocky ch trained that way with the chicken, to catch, <laughs> the, right, the greased chicken. Um, it was, it, no, but like, that was like real. It was just sort of like, okay, you're going to go there and actually try to catch the chicken. There was no choreography there. But I think that's part of when people say don't work with animals, kids, or water, that's because those are uncertain and you have to surrender to the lack of control about that. And yeah. just filming Ben with the lack of control is a pretty beautiful thing. Yeah, and that was fun and that, that was important to me to kind of like just kind of go with it. Like even like falling in the, the little pond, you know, it was like the day that we were shooting that. It was cold when we were shooting the movie. Uh, I mean, I remember the first day, like even like the, the uh, uh, the trailer lost energy. The little like mini trailer we had on the set lost the power, so there was no heat. And it was like 5:30 in the morning. I was like, okay, this. I'm like getting makeup and hair like with a blanket around me. And I'm like, this is going to be a different experience. And then the day we we're supposed to fall into the pond, or I was supposed to fall in the pond. It was like, it was like, it was like frozen pond. It was like it was frozen. So in the morning it was frozen. I'm like, all right. And I, I, went, I think I said to you, like, okay, so we're not actually going to do that today, right? We should push it back in the shoot. But by the way, this is like, you know, like December 1st. So let's push it back to January 12th when it'll be a lot warmer. Um, so, but I said, today's not the day, I don't think. And, and you're like, fine, we'll get the stunt man to do whatever. And then as the day wore on, I was like, well, actually, it's gone up to like 39 degrees. And then by like five o'clock in the afternoon, it was like 42 degrees. And, and I was like, all right, I guess I got to do this because he's going to let the stunt man do it. But then like, I'm going to feel like, you know, my, my ego is going to really be like, I got to go for it. And so it was that, that type of thing where we're just like, all right, let's just do it. Let's see what happens. We're not even, you know, we're like, we're in a, on a farm that's like 40 miles out of Cincinnati. It's like, it didn't even feel like we were making a movie. It was just like, we were kind of like just filming stuff. Yeah. You know, so it was that, that looseness was great. And, and I think, you know, that, that was throughout the whole shoot. For David, when you're working with somebody like Ben, who is also a very accomplished director, is it changed things at all, or, or do you find that 
people who have experience doing what you do approach acting in a different way, or are you able to have conversations differently? With a project like this, that you know, we, we can always speak to the chaos because that's kind of what makes the movie feel special and unique. But I don't think you can approach chaos in its in its most chaotic and capture it unless you have a sophisticated navigator of these sequences. So rather than having to, to rehearse the movie to death, by, by putting a pro like Ben that gets the comedy, gets the emotion, um, gets the drama of what we're trying to achieve, and, and most importantly can keep, keep the scene on track because it would be very easy to derail if we let all hell break loose, as it, as it often did. But, but that's what's so great is to be able to take that skill, and not only his skill as an actor, but he's a, a, a masterful director. And so, so having those kind of conversations of technically what we need to achieve to be able to give this, this, this film a sense of architecture that for, for my hopes were, was to take what we love about the bubblegum blockbuster comedies of the 80s and 70s and then add our own eccentric signatures of artsy fartsy films that inspire us. You were also talking a little bit about the fact that Hollywood doesn't make these kinds of movies that much anymore. Why do you think that's happened? Do you, do you feel like there could be a change and these types of films, these types of comedies could come back in vogue? I mean, I, I think, I, I don't know why. I mean, I think you know, the movie business has evolved in a very, you know, unpredictable way that none of us would have imagined 20 years ago uh, due to streaming and everything else. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I think, what people like to watch, what they like to feel when they go to the movies hasn't changed. You know, we're, it's the same reason people have gone to plays for thousands of years and, you know, the same reason why we need to experience storytelling and art in our lives. It's essential. And so I think it's just about making a commitment to going back to that and to, for I think all um, creative people feed on inspiration and experience and, and uh, to a certain extent, nostalgia of things that you watched when you were younger that inspired you. And I know, for me, I, I feel that. And I, I think that it's really important that filmmakers uh, of our generation uh, are committed to really sticking with that because it, technology is changing and the way people uh, process and watch uh, entertainment has changed so much that, you know, if you really believe in something and you, and you want to keep it alive, you have to commit to it. And, the marketplace will go up and down and change, but I think people uh, are, are always hungry for this kind of movie and, and a theatrical experience of this kind of movie because you don't get this kind of movie in the theaters that often. So that's that's where I'm hoping it, it'll go. But. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. And I feel like um, there's a cynicism over the last decade of comedies, and it's, and it's, and it's been a few years since since we really had that, that film drive audiences in mass to go and just laugh out loud that had the simplicity um, because I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of what I learned from my friend Jason Blum in the horror genre is you don't need big explosions and huge special effects to scare the crap out of people. And so taking some of the lessons that, that I learned with him in the horror genre and trying to apply it to comedy, which I think could follow the same rules of like people that make you glow on the inside when you watch them, they make you laugh. That's not, that doesn't need to cost a tremendous amount of money. That needs to come from a place of, of intentions and humor and, and, and warmth that... Um, I feel like we can deliver economically. And then the pressure's not on us so much to, to make something feel like it has to appeal to everyone. We can start um, curating things that, that we respond to from a personal level, from a self-indulgent level, and then slowly integrate that audience that, that we know could be significant for these films. You mentioned pressure, and Ben, you're returning with Severance, the second yeah. season, uh, which ended on a cliffhanger. What is yeah. it like to come back with a show that was so well received? And, and you know, what can audiences expect for the second season? Uh, it's uh, an interesting experience. I've never, I've never been through it before. A second season of anything. Everything I've done has gotten canceled <laughs> <laughs> back in the day. But um, you know, I feel like there's an expectation. Uh, that the audience has that they should have if they love something. And for us, it's just been the process of trying to, for us, live up to our expectation of what we think the show should be and, um, and commit to that. And, you know, it's been an interesting trying time over the last few years to make things uh, on all levels for people, you know, well, first with uh, the pandemic and, and then for us, the second season, you know, we're getting interrupted by the strike. Um, and the crunch that's put on so many people. So to keep that um, sort of focus on trying to, to, to make the best possible season 
um, being aware that like it, it's taken a long time, and uh, you know, I, I like other people, you know, get frustrated when things take a long time. I want to have the, the next season sooner, and um, so I understand that feeling of like the expectation. Okay, well, you know, it's taken a long time. I hope it's good. Um, you know, people are just wanting something to live up to what wh what they've uh, experienced, and have it hopefully, you know, not let them down, and so. I don't know. You know, all you all you can do is try to you know do what you think is good, and I'm, I'm excited for it. I mean, I think we put it put everything into it, and uh, it's been fun to kind of uh, explore the story and work with these actors and and with Dan and um, you know ha I've never had that experience of, of of being with something so long where the the characters really uh, start to have a life and the actors understand the characters so well and. Um, it kind of grows into something more, and, that, and it's been really uh, enjoyable working on that. And I'm really, I'm really excited for uh, for the second season for people to finally see it. Well, thank you both so much, and congratulations right. on the film. Thanks, Thanks man. All right.